11 years ago, my wife and I had just had our third child, and so we made one of the most difficult decisions we had to make as a couple up to that point, and we bought a minivan. And so I just handed over my man card for a little bit. We drove around in this minivan because they're just so stinking practical. You know what I'm saying? So we made that decision. We're driving in the minivan. We're going down the freeway. And I'll never forget this moment as the three kids are just kind of, you know, they're strapped in the back. Uh, We're going down the freeway and all of a sudden my heart starts beating fast. And I I start going, man, what what is happening right now? And I I was feeling a little short of breath and my fingers started tingling and I thought, I'm I'm having some kind of a, a heart attack or a heart situation or whatever. And I started feeling like I was getting tunnel vision. And my wife immediately, she noticed, she's like, oh, are you okay? Something's wrong. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I think I need to get off the freeway. And so I ended up pulling over and pulling onto the shoulder and (sighs) catching my breath and going, I think I might need to go to the hospital. I don't know what's happening. She just kind of talked me through it. And eventually it went away and spoiler alert, I didn't die in that moment, but I ended up, you know, continuing on. I was like, I think I'm okay. And a couple weeks later, we're driving down the exact same spot on the freeway and my heart starts beating fast and I feel like I can't catch my breath and I'm getting tunnel vision and all of that and I, I realize I, I think I'm, I'm having a panic attack. And later on I would realize that that's what was happening. I had issues with anxiety. It was through counseling that I began to realize uh, these, were, these were regular panic attacks. And when we were driving down the freeway, that's when my wife and I would have conversations about you know, schedules and who's taking kids where, because we had three kids in three years. It was like boom, boom, boom. And so they're all in car seats and boosters and all that. And it was just a stressful time. And my wife, she had stopped working. And so now we were just dependent on my income and we would talk about our finances and it would trigger these attacks. And again, it wasn't until getting counseling that I realized, oh, this is a, this is a real struggle for me. Today, as we're talking about mind wars, we're gonna talk about overcoming anxiety. And in this series, we've been looking at this passage. This is written by Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse two. Paul writes this. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As we talk about mind wars, some of the greatest battles that you and I will face are battles of the mind. Be transformed, he says, by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Chad talked about that the last couple weeks. Today, as we talk about overcoming anxiety, I wanna start by saying this. The mind is incredibly powerful. This is why Paul says, be transformed, experience a metamorphosis by the renewing of your Mind And when it comes to our minds, one of the things that's a very common struggle is the struggle of anxiety. We're gonna talk about what scripture says. We're also gonna look at the science of anxiety today. But I saw a study in 2019, two out of three Americans reported having severe anxiety. Two out of three. Wrestling with anxiety or even severe anxiety. In 2019, Do you remember, you probably don't remember 2019. Do you remember how amazing 2019 was? Like everything was just bliss and we're like, 2020, it's gonna be great. You know, and then we got into it and we were like, wait a minute, what's happening? And it was incredibly stressful. So if in 2019, two out of three Americans said, yeah, they wrestle with anxiety, just imagine how that's continued to to increase. What I wanna talk about today as we talk about overcoming anxiety is that I believe there is a path that God can lead us down, that scripture has guided us to, that we can actually overcome anxiety. But in 30 minutes of me preaching up here, it's not gonna solve anxiety if you're one of those people who wrestle with anxiety. You're not gonna walk out of service and go, okay, it's done, it's taken care of, but I believe we can take steps. Here's two things that I believe. One, it's gonna take time, and two, it's gonna take courage. To overcome anxiety means we have, to, we have to deal with some things, we have to unpack some things, and we need to understand some things. It's gonna take time and it's gonna take courage, but I've been praying that, that through this message it would be maybe a catalyst for some of us to start taking some steps and to begin to experience the freedom of overcoming anxiety. Now, I have a, a friend here to help me illustrate something. His name, we're gonna call him Frank. And as we understand the human mind and this thing that is incredibly powerful, there's something I wanna 
point out to us, inside the human brain, buried deep within it, there is this tiny little thing that's in the shape of an almond located right there called the amygdala. And the amygdala, it's a wonderful gift from God. He's created the mind in such a way that this is a great protector of us. The amygdala is what springs into action anytime you see something that, that should make you afraid. I'm gonna tell you a quick story about my amygdala. Here we go. So I was hiking with a buddy, and as we're hiking, I'm in deep conversation with him, so I'm not really thinking about the surroundings. Now, if you're from Arizona, you know that whenever you're hiking in Arizona, you're paying attention to the trail. I wasn't paying attention. I was too busy talking to my buddy, and as we're chatting or whatever, I, I hear this sound, and I'm, I'm kind of deaf, but the sound is like, and so what I do, since I was like, I don't know where that's coming from, what's happening? I, like an idiot, look up. And I'm like, where is that sound coming from? That is a terrible, like, wow, I've never heard that before. And so I'm looking up, like, is there an eagle screeching around somewhere? Like, Now my buddy, his amygdala, saw a threat and kicked into high gear. He was long gone. (laughs) And I'm just standing there looking up. And then once his brain finally realized that the imminent threat was no longer a threat to him, he yells out from a great distance, mind you, Snake. (laughs) And so I go from looking up to looking down, and here's what I saw. I have a picture for you. I saw this guy. Uh, In fact, that exact guy. I took that picture with my phone. So when I saw that guy, my amygdala then kicked into action, and my body was flooded with adrenaline. And all of a sudden, all I could focus on was that snake. I didn't see anything else in my surroundings. I didn't care about anything else. And I had this superhuman ability to leap in that moment. And I leapt out of the way, and then I pulled out my cell phone, and I took a picture of that snake. (laughs) So I could share it with all of you guys. But that part of the brain, the amygdala, it's actually, it's, it's a powerful tool that God has given the mind so that when we see a threat, when we see danger, this little guy says, hey, we need to get out of danger. We need to get out of harm's way. And we would even call that, 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 that is a form of anxiety. That is a form of fear. And that anxiety, it's a facilitating anxiety. Meaning when this thing kicks into action, it is a facilitating anxiety. It actually helps you as opposed to harm you. So facilitating anxiety is not a bad thing. I gotta figure out how this brain goes back together. There we go. Facilitating anxiety is not a bad thing, but there's a thing called debilitating anxiety, where the amygdala is now given the driver's seat, and it goes for a little joyride, and even if there's not a rattlesnake, there's not a threat, it's still just constantly leaning into fear and adrenaline and all of that. So after this snake incident, I'm now friends with my buddy. We, you know, he apologized for almost letting me die. I forgave him. We continue walking, and now all of a sudden, I'm on alert, right? That amygdala is now facilitating some things, and I'm looking everywhere, and 10 minutes later, I I take this picture. This is a different location, a different snake, same trail. I'm never going back to this trail ever again. (laughs) But the brain, it's, it's this tool that God's given us and this amygdala, it's a good thing. But what happens is when it is in the driver's seat, in the driver's seat now becomes this debilitating anxiety. It keeps us from wanting to live life. When I was in the car driving and all of a sudden my adrenaline's up and my heart rate's going and, and everything's getting tunnel vision, that was the amygdala taking over in a situation saying there's a threat when there actually wasn't. And if you're here today and you struggle with debilitating anxiety, I believe God has a path for us to take to help us overcome that debilitating anxiety. And I wanna say this because I I think there's some of us, if you've grown up in some church traditions or maybe you've thought this or maybe somebody's even said this to you of, hey, as a Christian, you're not supposed to have anxiety. The Bible says, don't worry, don't be anxious, that you shouldn't have anxious thoughts or whatever. And, And let me just say this, you can write this down in your notes. Anxiety is not a sin, it is a symptom. Anxiety is not a sin, it is a symptom. Just like when the fire alarm goes off in your house, if you're cooking, you know, like I sometimes do, and now that's like the dinner bell, right? And the little smoke alarm starts going. Uh, If I were to go, oh, there's a problem here, I'm just gonna take the batteries out of that smoke alarm. That doesn't actually solve the problem. The smoke alarm is just the alert saying, hey, there's something else that's not right. To take the batteries out doesn't solve the problem, you gotta put out the fire. And when there's anxiety attacks, 
That's the alarm going off. If you wrestle with anxiety, it is not a sin, it is a symptom. There is something happening below the surface that I believe God wants us to, to break, break free from. There are people in the Bible that wrestled with anxiety, that wrestled with mental health. Paul, who we just read what he wrote, and we're gonna read something else that he wrote to the church at Philippi. Paul writes, when he talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter one, he talks about being under great pressure beyond their ability to endure, he says, so that we despaired of life itself. Paul was wrestling with mental health. King David in the Old Testament, throughout the Psalms, you see him wrestling with his mental health, asking the question, why are you so downcast, my soul? That he would begin to get caught in these loops and God would have to help him to, to frame what he was looking at differently, to think differently, to perceive differently. We see that throughout the different psalmists in the Old Testament. Jesus, in Matthew 26, said this, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death in the Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus would go to the cross. And he had to remind, he had to submit himself, God, not my will, but your will be done. Elijah in the Old Testament wrestled with mental health. All throughout scripture, what I love about the Bible, it doesn't hide that there are people wrestling with anxiety. There are people who wrestle with depression. There are people who wrestle with fear and worry. And, and the Bible says, we're gonna tell their story and we're not gonna hide that. And if that's you and you wrestle with those things, here's what that means. That means that you're normal. Anxiety, it's not a sin, it is a Symptom, Paul, who at one moment despaired of life itself, writes what we're about to read while he is in prison, awaiting trial and eventually execution. And here's what Paul writes in Philippians chapter four, verse four. If you have your Bible, you can open it up there. Or it'll be here on the screen. He says this, rejoice. He's writing from prison about to face trial and eventually execution. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. And then he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, he says in every situation, well, what about my situation? Does, is this, would this apply here? In every situation, what about, you know, I don't know if it's that big of a deal. It seems kind of small, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. In this passage, God is revealing through Paul a path to overcoming anxiety. A path to experience freedom. But it does take some courage, what we're about to look at, does take some courage to take our anxieties and to bring them out into the light. Now think about this in, in nature around us. The things that we love, I love to sit in my backyard and we have fruit trees and some other things that we've planted over the years. And things like fruit and flowers and trees and grass and all of that, do you know what that requires? It requires light. Sunlight. And healthy amounts of it for it to grow. Things like mold spores, fungus, moss, that can grow in the dark, but that's not the kind of stuff you wanna grow. When it comes to the things of our mind, there are some things that will grow in darkness, but they're not the things we want to grow. 
And when it comes to our anxieties, if we'll take those things that we're anxious about, that we're worried about, that we're fearful over, and if we will bring them into the light, it will take an incredible amount of courage, but it'll begin to lose its power when we bring it into the light. And the healthy things that we want in our mind will begin to grow as we submit them, we bring them into the light, and we allow the truth of God, we allow the wisdom and the counsel of others, we allow the Holy Spirit by his power to begin to shine that light on whatever those things are, then the the fruit will begin to grow. But we have to be courageous and we have to give it time. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. To bring your anxiety into the light, bring your anxiety into the light first with yourself. You have to first acknowledge that there's, there's something going on. You have to begin to think about, okay, what is happening when it comes to what I'm thinking about? Paul says this, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And what Paul is saying in this moment, you and I, out of all of the creation, everything that God has made, you and I are the only animals in creation, so to speak, that have the ability to do what we just looked at. We have the ability to think about what we think about. Animals can't do that. You and I have the ability to think about what we think about. Just just think about that. That's pretty incredible. So Paul says, begin to think about what you think about. Begin to be honest with yourself. Begin to bring this into the light. Now, the brain, I talked a little bit about some of the science we're gonna talk about. The brain is fascinating. There's, There's a thing called the prefrontal cortex. It doesn't finish developing until around the age 25. So if you have a teenager and you're like, what are they thinking? They're not done cooking yet, okay? They need more time. But the prefrontal cortex is is the reasoning, it's the logic part of the brain that allows us to go, what I'm doing has real consequences and here's the connection between action and consequences. That's the prefrontal cortex. The ability to think about what you think about, that's the prefrontal cortex and it's massive. And yet that tiny little amygdala likes to take the steering wheel and go, no, we're going for a drive. Paul says, no, think about what you think about. Choose to focus on, choose to think about that which is true, that which is pure and lovely, excellent and praiseworthy. At the root of our anxiety, there's fear. If we were to just kind of boil it down and go, okay, if that's a symptom, what is the cause? At the root of an anxiety, whatever that is, you can, you can, follow it all the way down, there's a fear somewhere. And to begin to think about, okay, so what is the fear? For me, when I would talk to my wife about finances and all of a sudden I'd have these panic attacks and, and all of a sudden all this you know, anxiety or whatever would begin to crush, what, what is the fear? And, and begin to bring that into light, acknowledge, identify, what is it? Sometimes that fear is not even in our consciousness, it's in our subconscious, it's because of a past Trauma could be a number of reasons why we have that fear, and we don't even know that that fear is there. My wife and I, just a few years ago, we were dealing with something where we went and saw a professional counselor, and we said, hey, we need help with this. By the way, if you're wrestling with something and you feel like you're kind of stuck and you need help, uh, to go see a therapist, a board-certified counselor is a really good thing to get help, to get outside wisdom and guidance. And so my wife and I, we were doing this over Zoom, and so it was actually a couple years ago because it was during COVID, crazy, all that. And so everything's on Zoom, and you know we're on screens like all day long, and so we're on the screen now with our counselor in our living room, we're sitting on the couch, and on the screen, we're talking to the counselor, and all of a sudden, he stops us, and he says, hey, I wanna stop you right there, Lindsay. Calls her out, and I'm like, oh, good, he didn't say my name, okay. He says, Lindsay, I want you to describe Physically, what is happening to your body as we are talking about this topic? And he said, how's, how's your neck muscles right now? Like, what's happening? She's like, okay, yeah, they're tense. He said, what's your heart rate? She goes, well, it's elevated. Okay. He said, describe to me your hands. And she goes, well, they're, they're balled up in fists. And her body was tense and her heart rate was up and her adrenaline was spiked. And he said this, he said, what your body is doing right now is it's responding to some fear in your mind as if there's a bear in the room. 
As if in your, your mind, your, your mind, your amygdala is taking control and saying, hey, there's a real threat here, and so we're either gonna fight or flee, and your body is preparing to do one or the other. You're either gonna fight a bear or you're gonna try and outrun Robert. He didn't say it that way, but that's exactly what her brain was doing. By the way, if you're being chased by a bear, you just have to be the fastest person or not the slowest person to survive that. That's just a free side. But her body was like, oh, I'm ready to fight this bear. And so this counselor over this Zoom call, he says, "Um, you guys are in your living room. Lindsay, Robert, there is no bear. And when you talk about this topic, sometimes you have to remind yourself that there is no bear. But that fear was creating that, that response. We need to bring our anxiety into the light with ourselves. In the book, The Body Keeps the Score, the author writes this. As long as you keep secrets and suppress information, you are fundamentally at war with yourself. The critical issue is allowing yourself to know what you know. To identify the fear is what the author is saying. To know what you know, why is it that that anxiety is sparking? Don't suppress it, don't hide it, don't pretend like it's not a problem, it's not an issue. If it is affecting your life, if it is affecting your relationships, critical issue is allowing yourself to know what you know, that takes an enormous amount of courage. So my question is, what is it that you're afraid of? What is it that you're afraid of Through counseling, I began to realize that my anxieties, the core fears, one was a fear uh, that was connected to money. I mentioned that one earlier. Another one was a fear of failing as a father. And until I began to identify that's what that core fear was, I wasn't able to deal with the anxiety. Bring it into the light. Allow yourself to know what you know. What is it that you're afraid of? Identify it. Don't just react to the symptoms. Identify the root. Call it out, acknowledge it, bring it into the light. Second thing, bring your anxiety into the light with God. Bring your anxiety into the light with God. If you're like, oh, he already knows it, Paul says, in every situation, in this situation, that's, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Every situation means if it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. He cares about it because he cares about you. As a dad, when my kids are, are struggling, when my kids are having a tough time, the last thing I want is for them to keep it to themselves, to stay quiet about it, to just silently kind of suffer through whatever they're wrestling with. I want them to come to me and go, Dad, I want to talk to you about what's going on. The picture the Bible gives us of our relationship with God is that he is our heavenly father, And he cares for you. And he cares for what's going on in your mind. And if you're dealing with anxiety and you're wrestling with those things, he wants to know that, that we bring our petitions, our requests before God. When I was struggling with panic attacks, one of the most helpful pieces of advice I received was from my grandmother. And my grandma said, okay, Robert, here's what you're gonna do. Next time you start having a panic attack, I want you to pray. I'm like, piece of cake, I'm panicked. Of course I'm gonna pray. God, help me. I gotta get out of whatever the situation is. She says, no, 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 you're gonna pray for somebody else. You're gonna pray for somebody else. I want you to pray for you know, the, this person and their, their ministry, and I work with other pastors, and I want you to pray for them. I want you to pray for their family. I want you to pray for somebody other than yourself. Whenever you start having those attacks, let that be a trigger to pray for other people. And what it did is it began to take my focus in those moments where I was just you know, so wrapped up and worrying about whatever I was worrying about to now I was focused on on other people and it began to free me actually of that, that panic attack. And she said, even if it doesn't, it's a pretty good thing to pray for other people, so go ahead and do it anyway. And so I began to do that. When we pray, a couple things happen. One, it moves the heart of God. God wants to hear us pray. God wants to hear us be honest with him about what's going on in our heart. It also, when we pray, It changes the chemistry of the brain. It changes the pathways, it changes the connections of the brain. In her book, Switch On, 
your brain. Dr. Caroline Leaf writes this, 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period. 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can rewire the brain to the degree that they can see it on brain scans. That they can see the visual effects that there's a rewiring, there's a, there's a chemistry change in the brain with regular focused prayer. Paul continues when he's talking about this, he says, with thanksgiving. So yes, in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. For some of us, we need to pause and go, okay, what is it that God's already done? I need to acknowledge that. I need to praise God for that. By the way, it's really hard to keep spiraling down those those loops of anxiety and at the same time being grateful for what God's done. To pause, to remember, to reflect helps break that, that cycle, that loop of anxious thoughts. And it could be that you're in a situation where you're like, yeah, but there's, there's a lot of bad stuff going on. Here, let me, let me just tell you this. There's also things that you have to be grateful for even in tough situations, even in tough times. For beginners, God loved you so much that he gave his one and only son, that Jesus gave his life for you on the cross, that he paid the debt of your sin that you and I couldn't pay, and out of love and grace, he offered new life, and by his resurrection, he's proven that he's conquered death on our behalf, and he offers this life to anybody who puts their trust in him. You and I have a lot to be thankful for. And that we have this hope that, that he's not only restoring our hearts and minds and souls in the here and now, but that there's a promise of a day to come where there's no more presence of sin. There's no more power of sin. There's no more penalty of sin. And that if there's something in your life that's not good, that you and I can rest assured that God is not yet done, that he is making all things new. That alone is a lot to be thankful for. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves with thanksgiving, God, look what you've already done. And now, God, I need your help in this area. God, this is what's on my mind. And if it's on my mind, then it's on God's heart. I can present those requests to him. When we gather together as a church and we, we sing songs, uh, that's not just about songs. Like, why do we do that? Why are we singing the songs? Or you get down and you're like, ah, I like this song better than that song. You realize there's power when we gather together and we worship God through song together. That again, it is rewiring the brain. It is shifting our focus to all we have to be thankful for. It is changing our focus off of our circumstances onto our heavenly father who loves us, who cares for us, who has provided a way for us. And when it comes to anxiety attacks, you can actually use worship as a weapon. That by worshiping God, you're, you're actually fighting against those anxious thoughts. You are shifting your focus onto what is true, whatever is right, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is excellent and praiseworthy. We're shifting our focus. Paul writes about it. When we spend time in the presence of God, one of the byproducts of that is peace. The Bible also talks about the byproducts are joy, rest, confidence, guidance, protection, and power. Those things are all the opposite of fear, worry, and anxiety. So when we gather together and we worship, we're actually fighting for our mental health. As we worship our Heavenly Father, we're choosing to focus our minds on what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. Third thing, bring your anxiety into the light with others. This one's really hard to do, but so powerful. Bring your anxiety into the light with others. Paul says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Paul, who said he despaired of life itself, says, hey, you guys have seen me wrestling through this. We've talked about these things. And then he says, put them into practice. Well, where do you put it into practice? With one another. He says, follow my example. Put it into practice with one another. Do the things that you've seen me do, that you see me writing about, talking about, Put them into practice. If you struggle with anxiety, I wanna say this to you. 
uh, you aren't crazy. We have an enemy that, that would want us to believe that, oh man, I'm crazy or I'm all alone. Nobody else is going through this. Nobody else is dealing with this. God's given us the church. It's a gift. Church is not a building that you sit in. It is a movement you choose to be a part of to help people meet, know, and follow Jesus. You are the church. And the church is a gift because when you say, hey, to other people who are part of the church, you go, hey, I'm wrestling with something. I'm dealing with anxiety. I'm, I'm hurting right now. And they say, yeah, I've been there. Or yeah, I'm going through something just like that. When they look you in the eye and they say, you are not alone, healing begins. We have Celebrate Recovery at Sun Valley. And if you're wrestling with something, hurt, habit, hang up, and you're like, I don't know where to start, go to Celebrate Recovery, and here's what I promise you, you're gonna walk in there and you might be tempted to believe the lie that you're all alone, and you're gonna walk in there and you're gonna begin to talk to others, and here's what you're gonna find out, you aren't alone. Life has so many challenges. Yet there's so many things that we all have in common that we're all wrestling with. Thinking that we're an island, it's just us, there's nobody else dealing with this. And then we begin to talk and realize, oh, you too. Yeah, me too. You are not alone. Bring it into the light with others. Talk with someone. There's so much freedom in just verbalizing. I'm not okay. As soon as you bring that into the light, it'll begin to lose its power. If you wanna keep that a secret, it's gonna continue to grow. You bring that into the light, it begins to lose its power. Now I realize this is a very complex topic and, and there's a lot of different reasons why we might have anxiety. It can be from past traumas, it can be from past abuse, it can be from chemical imbalances, it can be from pressures, whether it's internal or external. And so I wanna reiterate once again, it's okay to get outside help from a professional. It's okay to seek out help. And if you're like, I don't know even where to start, again, celebrate recovery, talk to your campus pastor. At each one of our locations, talk to your campus pastor. If you're watching online, we have an online campus pastor. Talk to your campus pastor, talk to our church staff, and, and we'll, help you, we'll help you take that next step. Came across this following statistic regarding Gen Z. Gen Z, this would include our high schoolers, young adults. The statistic about Gen Z was this, 91% of high school and college students report consistent and significant levels of anxiety associated with stress, 91%. 91%. Mental health's been a challenge for every generation. Uh, but this generation in particular, they've grown up with screens in front of their face their whole lives. With technology. Constantly robbing them of their attention. Dopamine releases that say just keep scrolling, keep scrolling. Social media that puts a giant magnifying glass on all of our social insecurities and just puts it on display for thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions. And what that does to the mind there is a generation that is in crisis when it comes to mental health. And so one of the ways that we wanna help bring this into the light as a church is we ask some of our professionals in our church if they would be willing to give their time and we're gonna do a parent and teen mental health workshop at the end of the month. On October 29th, at our Gilbert location from 10 a.m. to 12.30, it's gonna be two and a half hours. There's gonna be breakouts and all of that. Some of our speakers include Dr. Ray Branton, who's a psychologist, Dr. Ron uh, yeah, Don and Renee, I mix those two up. Dr. Don and Renee Wooster, Cheryl Simmons, Ben Malcolmson, he was the personal assistant to Pete Carroll, Dr. Dana Harris, my big brother, Lieutenant Chris Watson, and his little brother, Robert, are gonna be a part of this workshop. If you are a parent of a teen, you are a teenager, even if you can't attend together, ideally you can attend together, uh, but we wanna have a, a real honest conversation about mental health and to provide some tools and some discussion for families and for individuals. You can sign up for that by going to workshop.sv.cc, workshop.sv.cc. And if you are at all interested in that, I'm gonna ask that you would register for that quickly because we do have a limited number of spaces for that workshop. 
Uh, so if that's something that, that you're interested in or you know somebody who would benefit from that, again, workshop.sv.cc. Bring your anxiety into the light with yourself, with God, and with others. I was talking to a counselor as I was dealing with my anxiety attacks, and, and again, as we got to the, to the root fear, one of my fears was of dying. And I wasn't afraid for myself. My fear of dying was what would happen to my kids if I, if I died? If they grew up without a father. And that thought, I would get stuck on that thought and I would play out all the different scenarios and it began to become a debilitating anxiety. And the counselor looked me in the eye and he said, Robert, have you talked to God about that? And I was embarrassed as a pastor to say, no, I I haven't talked to God about that. I've been way too busy worrying about it. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And so I began to pray about it. Began to talk about that anxiety. And here's what happened is I would talk to God and go, God, I I love these kids. I want what's best for these kids. If something were to happen to me, what would happen to them? And, And I began to feel the peace of God saying, you know I love your kids even more than you do. And with the help of the counselor, he's like, have you ever just worked out a deal with God? Hey, God, would you take care of my kids? I'm like, can you do that? Is that an option? He's like, well, talk to God about it. And so I was praying, God, if anything ever happens to me, would you take care of my kids? Would you look after them? Would you be their heavenly father? And just as I began to talk and go, God, here's here's what's going on in my heart, I began to experience peace in ways I didn't know possible. That the God of peace would be with me. We're gonna end our service a little bit different. In fact, a lot different than we normally do. And I wanna ask the question, have, have you talked to God about whatever that fear, whatever that anxiety is, And in a moment, our campus pastors are gonna lead us through a a time of prayer. We're gonna talk to God about it. So I wanna ask you the question, what is it that you're afraid of? And our campus pastors, if ever you're wondering like, hey, I'm at a campus, whatever, how how do I connect with the pastor? And I I wanna talk to the pastor. Uh, Your campus pastor is your campus's pastor. They're here to pray with you, to walk alongside you to encourage you in your journey of following Jesus. We have our campus pastors and they oversee our staff at all of our locations. They're here to support you. So in a moment, the campus pastors are gonna lead us in a time of prayer of just making our requests known before God. And in preparation for that, I wanna pray for you. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and you would search our hearts, that you would reveal any area of anxiety That if there's something that we're afraid of, that Holy Spirit, you would make it known. Maybe there's something that's causing anxiety. We don't even realize it's causing anxiety. I pray that in this moment, Holy Spirit, you would reveal that. That you would search our hearts and help us to see any area that we're stuck in that loop, that we're afraid and it's debilitating us. And I pray that Holy Spirit, you would would work through this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.